initial early look at the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, it's now time to fully dive in and see how the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro stands up to my in-depth testing. For those that haven't seen my early look, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is the latest from Retroid and is the sequel to the incredibly popular Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and retains the same 16.9 screen and a horizontal form factor, but now packs an extra punch with the inclusion of the Dimensity 1100. So please join me, Rob the Retro Tech Dad, as we explore everything that the Pocket 4 Pro offers and determine whether the 4 Pro is the worthy successor to Retroid's Pocket 3 Plus. specs for the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, which is equipped with a 4.7 inch 16.9 touchscreen display at a resolution of 750 by 1334 with 500 nits of brightness. This is identical to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. It is powered by the MediaTek Dimensity 1100 with 4 Cortex A78 cores at 2.6 GHz and 4 A55 cores at 2 GHz. It uses the Mali G77 MC9 GPU clocked at 836 MHz. The Pocket 4 Pro comes with 8GB of LPDDR4X RAM and 128GB of UFS 3.1 internal storage with the option to expand via the microSD slot. The Pocket 4 Pro features USB Type-C for data, charging, and 1080p video out, as well as 3.5mm headset port and micro HDMI. The Pocket 4 Pro has built-in Wi-Fi 6, 802.11ax, and Bluetooth 5.2 support. The 4 Pro has a 5,000 mAh battery and it ships with Android 13 out of the box. It is available now directly from the Retroid website and Retroid is shipping units out on a daily basis, moving as fast as they can to get orders out. The 4 Pro is available in six different color options and is available for 199 US dollars, plus any applicable shipping fees and taxes. I wanna thank Retroid again for sending me this unit for the purpose of this review. And as I always require, they did not view this video prior to publishing. It's time to unbox, and this is definitely very familiar packaging for any prior owners of the Retroid devices. The packaging itself is very minimalistic, with just a few markings for the branding and then the color options, and there are six available, including black, 16-bit, 16-bit US, watermelon, ice blue, and crystal. The unit I have here is the black one. All right, let's cut the seal and then open up the flap to reveal what is inside. Let's go ahead and pull out the insert so we can check out the contents of the package. Okay, I'll pull the outer box to the side for now and let's remove the top protective foamy insert so we can get the Pocket 4 Pro out of its plastic tray. We're going to put this aside for a moment while we check out the rest of the contents. We have the user's manual looking right at us and this is a simple paper insert that details the features of the unit and specifications. Nothing too in depth here. Finally, we have the USB-A to Type-C cable. It's pretty hefty feeling and a decent length. I do like the Retroid Pocket branding that is now on the USB cable. This is a nice little touch. All right, we're all done here. Let's grab the Pocket 4 Pro and slowly take it out of its protective plastic baggie to reveal the device. As I mentioned earlier, I received the black unit and just first impressions in the hand. The plastic feels really nice on here and reminds me of the plastic from the transparent models of the 3 Plus. So let's now take a tour around the Pocket 4 Pro and get familiar with all the features available here. Let's start out the top right and take a look at the shoulder button and trigger. The R1 has a very nice texture going across the entirety of the button. I'm able to press down on the R1 from any point, which is always something that I like to see. I like the way these press down, they give off a light sounding clickiness, but it does press down really well. The shoulder trigger here is a nice improvement over the Pocket 3 Plus. These are now analog and have a solid range of movement, which is also nice and smooth and doesn't have a very stiff resistance. The R2 is larger than what was present on the 3 Plus, and so I find that it accommodates your fingers better, plus with the addition of the nice texturing, the trigger here feels really good. So let's move along, and things are quite different here than what we had with the Pocket 3 Plus. Starting first, we have the power button, which is where the start and select were located on the 3 Plus. Next to the power, we have the volume up and down, and then besides that, we have the exhaust vent, which is needed for the active cooling built into the 4 Pro. And finally, the micro HDMI port, which is one of two ways to have the display out on the Pocket 4 Pro. On the left side, we can take a really solid look at that texture that is now on the L1 and L2. Much like the right side, everything presses down the same way, as well as smooth movement for the trigger. 
going down the left side and there isn't anything here, which is a difference from the 3 Plus, which kept the volume up and down on this side. Now coming to the bottom of the 4 Pro, we have the left stereo speaker, and these are down firing much like they were on the 3 Plus. Similar to the 3 Plus, we have the micro SD slot that is protected by a cover that pops out to reveal the slot. I've always liked this approach as it helps keep dust and debris out of the slot, as well as being much easier to deal with than one that needs a pin. Next to the micro SD, we have the 3.5mm headset port, and then the USB Type-C for data, charging, and video out, and finally the right down firing stereo speaker. Let's now take a look at the back of the unit, and I do like this angle as it shows off that nice texturing on the plastic overall. Again, this really reminds me of the way my transparent 3 Plus feels versus the smooth, solid colors from that model. I like the minimal branding on the back, which was removed from the front bezel, and then of course the sizable intake vent for the active cooling. Okay, time to go front side and check out a close-up of the 4 Pro's D-pad, which is something that I've always liked for Metroid. The 4 Pros in particular is really good with a nice amount of movement and a good defined pivot which is noticeable when moving from side to side. You can really see how much travel we are getting here from this angle. Below that we have another significant improvement coming from the 3 Plus. These analog sticks actually made their first appearance with the Pocket 2S and return here to really give the 4 Pro a much improved experience. These have a wider range of movement compared to the 3 Plus and are much closer to a traditional analog stick versus the Switch style sticks from before. I also much prefer the concave analog stick cap here that is present on the 4 Pro. We can get a good look at how these sit above the face of the 4 Pro, which do sit a bit higher than we saw with the 3 Plus, and not all that surprising given the new sticks here. Moving down, we have another new addition coming from the 3 Plus, which is the inclusion of the home and back buttons on the face of the 4 Pro. And going across the front bezel, as I mentioned before, the Retroid branding has been completely removed here. Now on the right side, let's take a closer look at the face buttons. Probably notice that I have Skittles buttons here, and these were taken from my Pocket 2S, which we will definitely be talking about more in my teardown portion. You can get a look at the original setup in my early look video. The buttons are arranged in the BAYX Nintendo style out of the box, and it is also the way I have it set up here. I do really like the way these press down, and because we have slightly larger buttons here, they are also easier to press down on. Taking a look from the side, and you can see how much travel these have, as well as how they sit above the face of the 4 Pro. One thing I want to comment on is that the buttons are a bit noisier than I'd like. Below the face buttons, we have the right analog stick, and then below that, many will be very happy to see that the select and start buttons have been moved to the face of the unit. Both the select and start, as well as the home and back buttons, are using dome switches and are very quiet to press down on. Let's go ahead and boot up the Pocket 4 Pro for the first time and quickly go through the first time setup process, which will definitely be a familiar sight for anyone that has used one of Retroid's other products. I've always liked this as it makes the handheld feel less like a phone and more like a device that has dedicated controls. You can use both the touchscreen or built-in controls to navigate here, and this is where you will be setting up things like your language, Wi-Fi, as well as choosing which apps you want pre-installed. Personally, I go ahead and just install all of them and then decide after the fact what I don't want anymore. There's a good chance you will probably update some of the emulators that are part of this pre-installed process, but regardless, it is nice that this is part of the setup experience. And one last step, which is the launcher that you'll be using. Retroid does have their own launcher, which is very simple and again makes the 4 Pro feel more like a handheld. But for now, we will be selecting the standard Android launcher, so we can take a look at what everything looks like in Android first and then head over into the Retroid launcher. Welcome to the main screen of the Pocket 4 Pro. This is using Android 13, and like most of Retroid's other devices, is a very clean install of Android. The Pocket 4 Pro does include Google Play services for those that want access to the Play Store. Outside of the apps that I chose to pre-install, this is very vanilla, which leaves you to customize the way you like. Let's take a look at the quick access menu, which can be reached by dragging down from the top. This is fairly standard for Android and includes the usual options such as toggling on Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and airplane mode. A point of interest for this device is the performance toggle, which allows us to switch between three different presets, including standard, performance, and high performance. For each of these options, we have the ability to adjust some settings for the fan. On standard, we can completely turn the fan off, as well as change to quiet, smart, and sport. For performance, we are limited to quiet, smart, and sport. And finally, for the high performance option, we are limited to just smart and sport. Let's quickly look at the rest of the options here. And as typical for Android, you can add, edit, or remove the buttons here. Let's dive into the handheld settings, which does feature unique options made for the Pocket 4 Pro. 
This is where you can make adjustments to the display out functionality, as well as the inputs, including switching from the Switch style to Xbox style in software. Before we move on, I did want to show off a little bit of Retroid's own launcher. As I mentioned, this has a pretty minimalistic interface and for the most part, pretty easy to get set up. If we go into the systems portion on the bottom, we can select the consoles that we want displayed here. So I will go ahead and quickly pick some consoles to demonstrate the way it looks. With my choices made, you can see how this looks here with nice simple icons for each console. Now I haven't added any games yet, so when I go into one of the consoles, nothing will be displayed here. But it's also pretty simple to get your games pointed by just clicking on ROMs at the bottom and then point to the path where they are stored for that specific platform. And so this is just a very quick overview of the Retroid launcher. And the beautiful thing about Android is that you can really use any launcher you prefer, including something like the popular Daijisho. So let's talk about the build quality of the Pocket 4 Pro, which immediately feels very solid the first time you hold it. I think overall, the materials being used here are really solid. The 4 Pro shows no signs of flexing or even creaking when bending it, and nothing is rattling, including the shoulder or face buttons. The buttons, D-pad, triggers, and analog sticks are all working as expected. There is nothing rough or unfinished about the entirety of the unit. The black, which is the color that was sent to me, and not my own personal choice, surprised me because of how nice the material feels here, but also how it has held up pretty well to fingerprints. I've actually not wiped down the back of this unit in some time since returning from CES a few weeks ago. The panel being used here is very nice with good colors and brightness. It's a 4.7 inch 169 750x1334 panel, similar to the one used in the 3 Plus. The viewing angles are equally good with no issues looking at the panel from top down or side to side. Additionally, the brightness scales quite well, going from a fairly bright panel with 500 nits of brightness down to a very low level, suitable for dark environments. The audio from the down-firing speakers actually surprised me. I would have loved to see Retro put some front-firing speakers in this, maybe around the top of the unit by the face buttons and D-pad. However, the speakers that are present here get very loud at the top end. I was worried that my palms would obstruct the speakers given their location, but in my time gaming, I haven't really experienced that as an issue since they are far enough in that my palms don't actually cover them. Let's take a listen here with the soothing sounds of OutRun 2 to get a nice sense of these stereo speakers. And of course, my usual Marvel vs. Capcom 2 D-pad test and the 4 Pro didn't surprise me as I expected it to perform quite well. The movement of the D-pad is so good that it makes pulling off combos an absolute joy. More importantly, the D-pad is responsive and probably only limitation here is my own skills in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. You can see on screen that I am moving around, pulling off combos without much trouble, and the Retro D-pad is, for me at least, one of the better ones on the market. Now, something that I talked about during my early look was the green tint present in the image. Retroid at the time was aware of the issue and promised to correct this with an OTA update, which my device did receive and it does correct this. I am glad that this was resolved in a timely manner and retail units should not have this issue. I'll bring in my Pocket 3 Plus again just to compare the screen here and it's definitely apparent that this issue has now been corrected, which is great to see and should give most viewers a peace of mind. And we've now arrived at one of my favorite portions since it's an opportunity for me to bring in other devices for our size comparisons. On screen, I have the original Switch, Odin Lite, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, and a surprisingly highly requested comparison device, the PlayStation Vita. It's quite apparent immediately that these are all very different sized devices. Let's start with some weights on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, which comes in at 268 grams or about 9.5 ounces. Next up, we have the PS Vita, which comes in at under 8 ounces, or about 220 grams. Here we have the OG Switch with Joy-Cons attached, coming in at 14 ounces, or about 398 grams. Finally, the Odin Pro, which comes in at 361 grams, or a little under 13 ounces, and does have a slightly larger 6-inch screen. I thought this was an interesting device to include given it is now the same price as the Pocket 4 Pro. Let's grab the measurements of the 4 Pro quickly just to remind ourselves of the actual numbers here. The face buttons on the 4 Pro are larger than what we have with the 3 Plus. They come in at just 7mm and these two S buttons you see here are identical in size to the ones on the 4 Pro and we will be doing the swap in this video in just a little bit. The analog stick cap measures in at about 13.5mm and, and finally the thickness which is about 16mm. Let's compare the size of the 4 Pro to the Odin Lite here, which does share the same size as the Odin Pro seen hiding in the upper left corner of the screen. The Odin Lite is a good bit larger than the 4 Pro, which is expected here given the larger screen size. 
With the overhead view, it does appear that the 4 Pro and Olin Light share a similar thickness, and the Olin Light is just a little over 15 millimeters, so the two are very close. The face buttons on the Odin are slightly larger, coming in at a little over 7 millimeters. The analog stick caps here are definitely smaller coming in at 13 millimeters and personally one of my negatives with both the Lite and Pro. Let's check out how the Vita sizes up to the 4 Pro, which again was a requested device. The 4 Pro and Vita are almost about the same width, but the Vita is a little bit taller. The Vita face buttons are definitely smaller coming in at about 6.5 millimeters with smaller analog sticks, but it is thinner than the 4 Pro coming in at a little under 15 millimeters. Finally, the original switch with Joy-Cons attached which looks massive compared to the 4 Pro. In terms of thickness, these do seem quite similar, but let's quickly measure and it does appear that the Switch is thinner at about 14 millimeters. It's no secret that the face buttons on the Joy-Con are small, and these are smaller than the 4 Pro, coming in at under 7 millimeters. Surprisingly, the analog stick caps on the Switch are slightly larger at about 14 and millimeters. For further comparisons and measurements, I recommend checking out my early look video where I size up the 4 Pro to the 2S, Pocket 3 Plus, and the Odin 2. It's now time for our teardown, and for this there's going to be a few goals in mind. I like using the teardowns as an opportunity to see how difficult it is to reach the battery for replacement if needed, as well as how accessible certain components are like the analog sticks. Now for the 4 Pro in particular, I want to see if the face buttons are in fact hardware swappable, as well as check if they're compatible with the buttons from the Retroid Pocket 2S, which, if you've been watching, sorta has been spoiled. So on the back of the unit, we have four screws present. These are using Torx screws, so I'll grab my trusty iFixit and size up the appropriate bit. For this, I am using the Torx T5 bit, and let's go ahead and quickly remove the four screws from the back plate. As always, make sure to remove your micro SD card if you have one present before moving on. Okay, with all the screws out, let's pop off this back cover. I'm using a plectrum or just a guitar pick to help separate the shell. So I went in from the top and was able to wedge the pick in and help separate some of those tabs moving gently across the top and you can hear the taps continuing to separate. At this point, I am able to remove the rest of the back plate by hand. Don't be afraid to put a little force on here to get the cover off as there's nothing connected to the back cover, so don't worry about accidentally prying something off. Unsurprisingly, the back cover is made of a fairly flexible plastic, but that's not an issue as it helps keep the weight down. This is a little bit different than how something like the 2S is set up, for example. The shoulder triggers are actually part of the back plate, so let's take a closer look at the mechanism here. We now have a nice look at the internals of the Pocket 4 Pro with the back cover removed. There's definitely some very obvious components staring at us including the fan, massive heatsink, and battery. I have to say that I'm impressed with how clean everything looks inside, including the use of the black colored boards. Here we can see the included 5000 mAh battery, and I'll be talking a lot more about battery life in just a bit. So it does appear that the analog sticks can be easily swapped out. They are not buried under any other boards, and the connection cable as well as screws to remove it are fully accessible. Let's confirm this by actually removing it. We will need to switch up our bit, and all these screws internally are just standard Phillips screws. There are two screws holding down the analog stick in place, so let's quickly remove them, and then carefully disconnect the cable from the daughter board. Once done, you can see how easy it is to remove the stick from the 4 Pro. This is awesome to see for anyone needing to do replacements or even just to mess around with alternative colors that are available for sale on the Retroid website. So let's dig deeper now and get to the face button so I can check out a few things I'm wondering about. Again, I have to comment about how nicely put together everything is here. We even have captain tape placed down to secure connections. We're going to need to remove the daughter board, and in order to do that, we do need to remove the speaker here to get access to a screw that is hidden underneath. The speaker is secured with a fairly strong tape, so you will need a bit of force to get it out. Make sure to disconnect the cable before removing. Once removed, we now have access to all the screws, so it looks like there are four screws that need to be removed. Let's go ahead and quickly do that. Now, let's disconnect the rest of the cables. There is one on the side here covered with captain tape and another at the top for the R1 button. Gently remove the tape so you can save it for use later, and then gently disconnect the cable for the R1 as well. The daughter board should now be very easy to remove. You can see that we have the pads for the rubber membranes on the face buttons, and then the dome switches for the start and select buttons. Let's now take a closer look at the face buttons starting with the rubber membrane. Looking at the membrane from the side, and it's pretty apparent why the travel is quite good on the 4 Pro. This is a really solid membrane. And now we can get really close up with the way the face buttons are keyed. 
So looking at this, it does appear that these will require a modification to the buttons themselves in order to make them swappable. As you can see, swapping the B button to the original A position, and this will not fit as is. The same can be said for the A button. Now the Retroid website does state that these are hardware swappable, but I did confirm that they do need a slight modification for that. You will need to cut off the third peg in order to make them swappable. It's important to note that the Retro website now shows this under the DIY section for replacement buttons that you can buy. I've had quite a few viewers ask me about the Pocket 2S's buttons and whether or not they will be swappable into the Pocket 4 Pro. Now, in my early look, I did measure the buttons and these were identical in size, so off camera, I did take apart my 2S to get it prepped for this video. Let's first compare the two membranes here, and these definitely look pretty identical. Now, I'm already noticing that these might be keyed differently, but let's take the Skittles buttons out of the 2S and try to place them into the 4 Pro. Starting with the B button, this one fits without any modification. Moving along to the Y button, which also fits, and then the A button, which fits as well. And finally, the X button, which surprisingly does not fit in the 4 Pro. That's pretty wild to me. You can see in the palm of my hand how these are keyed differently. So I grabbed the Sharpie and I carefully marked off part of the peg to then clip off so I can make it fit into the 4 Pro's shell. Clipping the excess piece off and now the button can fit without issue. This is definitely nice to know as Retroid does sell some unique colors for the 2S that can now work on the 4 Pro if you desire. For example, I think the white buttons from the Indigo model will be pretty popular. I've gotta say, I actually really like the way the skills buttons look with the black 4 Pro, and I'm thinking of keeping it this way, but I'm curious to hear what my viewers think, so definitely let me know down in the comments. It's now time to return to our teardown and continue to see what is needed to gain full access to the battery here. We will need to remove the heatsink assembly, which is held into place by four screws, two of which are hidden under protective tape. Let's quickly get these four screws out of here so we can move along. With all the screws out of the way, carefully disconnect the cable from the mainboard. We can now take a look at the heatsink and fan, which is pretty substantial, and it's nice to see the active cooling present so that we can push that Dimensity 1100 a bit harder than normal. Now with that heatsink out of the way, we finally have access to the battery connection and can now unplug and remove the battery for removal. So this is the process that would be needed to get to the battery for replacement or servicing. As usual, the battery is held into place with a strong adhesive. There are actually small tabs that you pull out to remove the adhesive to make the battery lift out of place easily. And so with all of that, let's get this back together and then dive back into benchmarking. And in my first round for my early look, I compared the performance between the T618 in the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus to the Dimensity 1100 in the Pocket 4 Pro. This time around, I want to compare the numbers between the different performance profiles of the Pocket 4 Pro, as well as bring in some other chipsets and devices to see where the Dimensity 1100 and the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro stand. First, let's compare the three profiles of standard, performance, and high performance built into the Pocket 4 Pro and see how that translates to synthetic benchmarks. Let's first discuss the Geekbench 6 numbers, which will give us a good idea of the CPU performance between the three different profiles. In standard mode, with the fan turned off, the Pocket 4 Pro scored 830 in the single core score and 3041 in the multi core score. In performance mode, with the smart fan setting, the Pocket 4 Pro scored 983 in the single core score and 2933 in the multi core score. So far, this tells me that we are seeing a boost in single core performance with a slight drop off for multi core performance. Finally, the high performance mode with the smart fan setting, the Pocket 4 Pro scored 1092 in the single core score and 3046 for the multi core score. It's clear that as we bump up those performance profiles, we are definitely seeing a slight boost in performance for that single core score. Now let's switch gears to the Wildlife Extreme benchmark, and this will give us a good sense of GPU performance. This is probably the most interesting of the benchmarks, and first you will see that the Pocket 4 Pro scored 1257 with the standard mode and the fan turned off. Switching to performance mode with the smart fan setting and the 4 Pro scored 1151. I did retest this multiple times and the scores were very consistent. Finally, the high performance mode with the smart fan setting and the 4 Pro scored 1268, which based on these results really indicates that the performance profiles are quite comparable between the three. Now we can take a look at the Antutu scores, which gives us a good picture overall of the CPU and GPU performance. The Pocket 4 Pro with the standard performance mode and the fan turned off scored 609,809 overall. 
Now with the 4 Pro set to performance mode and the smart fan setting, we saw a small increase in the overall score coming in at 631,955. Finally, the high performance mode with the smart fan setting and the 4 Pro scored 727,758 overall. It's clear that each performance profile does in fact scale as expected with the high performance option giving us the best performance. Okay, now let's bring in a few other devices into the picture. For this, I wanted to bring in both the Odin Lite and Odin Pro. These two devices are actually being offered for essentially the same price right now as the Pocket 4 Pro and therefore is essentially a competitor to the 4 Pro at around that $199 price point. The Odin Lite has the Dimensity 900, which will also give us an idea of what to expect with the standard Pocket 4 once that ships, and then the Odin Pro with its Snapdragon 845. For fun, I am throwing in the Odin 2 because at its price point, it is really the one to beat when it comes to high-end Android gaming despite the additional $100 cost. So in Geekbench 6, bringing in the Odin Pro, which scored 569 for its single-core score and 2059 for its multi-core score, we can see that the Snapdragon 845 falls behind the Dimensity 1100. It's not much of a surprise here, the Snapdragon 845 is definitely showing its age. And now we have the Odin Lite and the Dimensity 900, which scored 923 for its single core score and 2381 for its multi core score, which does slightly outperform the Snapdragon 845, but falls a little behind the Dimensity 1100. And finally, I don't think it's going to be much of a surprise here, but the Odin 2 with its Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 scored 1,983 for its single core score and 5,462 for its multi core score, which absolutely destroys all the devices on screen. Much of the same thing can be seen with the Wildlife Extreme Test, with the Odin Pro coming in at 632, and not too far behind it, the Odin Lite with 593. However, the Pocket 4 Pro nearly doubles the score of the Odin Pro and Odin Lite. And again, the Odin 2 coming in with 3,699, which absolutely destroys the other scores. Finally, in Antutu, we're seeing much of the same story here, with the Odin Pro coming in at 375,653 for its overall score, and then the Odin Lite coming in at 483,996 for its overall score. Both the Odin Lite and Pro, as seen in the other tests, lags behind the Dimensity 1100 and the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. The Odin 2 with its Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, much like the other tests, runs away with a commanding jump in scores over all the other devices here. There's no doubt that the Odin 2 is an absolute powerhouse. One last thing I wanted to check was the Dimensity 1100 thermal stability, which is actually solid across all three performance profiles. However, I did observe throttling when doing battery testing with God of War 2 and had to change my battery testing strategy. I had the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro set to standard performance with the fan turned off and scaled back the resolution to just native, and just about an hour into my test, I noticed that we were starting to see thermal throttling happening with God of War 2, which was no longer hitting 60 frames per second. Now, I thought it was important to disclose my findings since one hour in is not a lot of time and many viewers will be gaming for this amount of time in one city. But we will definitely be talking about thermals and battery testing and all that in just a little bit. Okay, with benchmarking out of the way, let's go ahead and revisit emulation. This time around, I wanted to include some viewer requests since many viewers suggested great games that I thought would also be worth testing out, performance especially in PS2 and GameCube. So now for a little story time. I actually got the pleasure of finally meeting Russ from Retro Game Core in person, and during some talks we realized that, that we both had experienced different results with PlayStation 2 emulation depending on the game. He was surprised when I said that Sly Cooper was running quite well on my Pocket 4 Pro, which then made us realize that the versions of Ether SX2 actually make a difference. I was running the included build of Ether SX2, which at the time was the 3064 one, but I've also personally tested the 3668 build and can confirm that Sly Cooper runs the same there as well. Now Russ said he was using Nether SX2, and so at that moment is when we discovered that there were pretty vast differences in performance between builds. So I went ahead and tested PlayStation 2 emulation in both Ether SX2 using build number 3668, and then again in Nether SX2 to see some of the differences. No doubt about it, Sly Cooper ran very poorly in Nether SX2, which you can see on screen. And now let me switch back to the 3668 build of Ether SX2, and you can see that Sly Cooper does vastly better here. This is being done at two times the native resolution using the NTSC version with the Vulkan backend and the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro set to its high performance mode with the smart fan option. Interestingly, I observed this difference in other games. This time around, I saw this happen in another reviewer requested game. Champions of Norath is another very demanding game to run for PS2 emulation, and in the 3668 build of Ether SX2, Champions ran poorly. However, if we switch back to Nether SX2, 
you can see the game is faring a lot better. Once again, I have this game set to 2 times native resolution with the Vulkan backend and I am using the NTSC version. The Retro Pocket 4 Pro is set to high performance mode with the Smart Fan option. So for Champions, my results were the opposite of what I experienced with Sly Cooper. Jack 2 was another viewer requested game and definitely one well worth checking out as it's another very difficult game to emulate. And so this is another great test of the Pocket 4 Pro's abilities. For Jack 2, I experienced similar results as I did with Champions. And for this game, Jack 2 was mostly a poor experience with the 3668 build of Ether SX2. In fact, for this game, you're going to most likely want to use the PAL ROM to try and get the best performance out of it. And when I tested Nether SX2, I definitely had better results. And while it's still not perfect, I found this to be pretty solid overall and actually quite impressive, since Jack 2 is so notorious for being difficult. For Jack 2, I recommend using Nether SX2 with the PAL ROM and set to native resolution using the high performance mode with the Smart Fan option. We are really close here. Finally, one last viewer requested a game and another good one to demonstrate some of the capabilities here of the Dimensity 1100. Gran Turismo 4 actually performed about the same in both Nether SX2 and the 3668 build of Ether SX2. I wanted to show off footage of both a city track as well as one of the rally tracks, and naturally I decided to go with my hometown of New York City and my current home of Arizona. Gran Turismo performs really well on the Pocket 4 Pro with two times native resolution, the Vulcan backend, using the NTSC version with the 4 Pro set to high performance mode and the Smart Fan option. So let's quickly talk about PlayStation Portable. I don't think it's much of a surprise that the PSP will do quite well with the Pocket 4 Pro, and we know from my early look that the 4 Pro does bring a sizable performance boost over the 3 Plus, which was already able to do PSP. However, we can take things much higher now on PSP, and the results are pretty impressive. Let's start out with one of my personal favorite games to showcase on the lighter end, which is Loco Roco, and it is maxed out with PPS's PP at 10 times the native resolution, and the 4 Pro is set to standard performance with no fan turned on. I was expecting Loco Roco to run quite well here, but this is definitely pretty amazing to see, and I think many lighter games will have no issues with that max 10 times upscaling. Now for a game that is a little bit more demanding, and another consistent entry on the channel. Ridge Racer on PSP has always been one of my absolute favorite racing games on the platform, and really to see it on the 4 Pro screen at 8 times native resolution is very impressive. It's truly amazing to see how great PSP games look at this resolution as well as with this pixel density. You will definitely notice details in games that you've probably never seen before. Ridge Racer is another game that's using the standard performance mode with no fan on. Finally, it wouldn't be appropriate to showcase PlayStation Portable performance without at least one of the God of War games. For this one, we have Chains of Olympus, and it's no secret that this is one of the more demanding games for PSP. But here we are at 5 times native resolution, with the 4 Pro set to its performance mode and the quiet fan option. One of the key things to remember here is that these games will not require any tweaks, hacks, or special performance cheats to get the level of performance that you are seeing here. It's now time to move on to Nintendo's platforms, and let's start out with GameCube, which like PlayStation 2 has been the other platform many are excited about with the 4 Pro. First things first, let's revisit F-Zero GX. Now if you missed it from my early look, I pinned a note and made a quick video clip showcasing that F-Zero GX actually does quite well at 2 times native resolution with the Dolphin emulator from the Play Store. For whatever reason, the emulator disables the dual core option by default, so you will want to make sure that in your custom configuration, you have the dual core option enabled. It's definitely very exciting, and it's a great thing to see F-Zero running this well with Dolphin. Now for a viewer request, Wire World was actually just featured in my Raspberry Pi 5 GameCube emulation showcase, and it's always a joy to revisit this game. I mentioned in that video that this game is in many ways an overlooked gem that came to us from Treasure, the brilliant studio behind hits like Ikaruga and Radiant Silvergun. The Pocket 4 Pro is having no issues with this game, and the 2x upscaling is really helping clean this game up, and it just looks fantastic. Now with the extra power on hand with the Pocket 4 Pro, I do want to talk a little bit about the Wii. It's a platform that I feel doesn't get as much love or attention as GameCube for emulation, but on the 4 Pro we definitely have some power on hand to run a good portion of the library. The Wii is always tricky to emulate because of its controls, but there are a lot of games that let you use a classic controller setup, and so I want to shift some focus to the Wii. 
In my early look video, I checked out Mario Galaxy 2, which ran very well. So this time around, I thought it'd be fun to check out another Mario game with New Super Mario Brothers. I don't think it's much of a surprise given what we saw in my early look, but New Super Mario Bros. does run very well with the 4 Pro. Again, this is using the Dolphin emulator from the Play Store set to native resolution, using the Vulcan backend, and the high performance mode setting with the Retro Pocket 4 Pro. Next, I wanted to feature a game that I feel doesn't get as much notice. Klonoa is actually a remake of the original game from the PlayStation, and this is an awesome version of the game with really great updated visuals. The game looks so good on the Retro Pocket 4 screen, and it's really a treat to see her running this well. Klonoa is using the same configuration as I did for New Super Mario Bros., and the best part about Klonoa is that it easily maps well to the 4 Pro's built-in controls, which makes Klonoa a great choice for the device. Finally, since we do have the extra power here, I wanted to show off the Wii version of Mario Kart. I'm excited that we are clearly able to play a lot more of the Wii library with the Retro Pocket 4 Pro, and I think the Wii is still very much a platform worth exploring with some very unique games and entries. I wanted to have some fun and see if we could push the Retro Pocket 4 Pro a little bit with Wii emulation, and so with Mario Kart Wii, I am actually set to 2 times native resolution, and the game does hold up quite well, very rarely dipping below the 60 frames per second target, especially after initial shader compilation has taken place. Let's now switch it up and check out Nintendo's latest platform. In my early look, I actually spent a good amount of time showcasing Switch emulation with the Yuzu emulator, and really, I found it very impressive. I had games like Super Mario Wonder running on the Retro Pocket 4 Pro, and it does really demonstrate just how far the Yuzu emulator has come since first dropping on Android. I personally just love testing Switch emulation out, and it's been a pleasant surprise. Naturally, you will not be buying a Pocket 4 Pro for the intention of Switch emulation, but it's a really cool bonus, and I'm finding that a lot more is playable than I originally expected. On screen, I have a personal favorite racing game of mine on the Switch, which is Cruising in Blast, and it is the perfect balance between updating a franchise as well as staying true to what made it great back in the day. I love the visuals and the fast-paced gameplay of Blast, and I have it running here with Yuzu at native resolution and handheld mode. The Retro Pocket 4 Pro is set to use the high performance option, and really, the results are pretty impressive. I did receive a viewer request for Sonic Superstars, and I thought that would be an interesting one to showcase, and a game I was optimistic would run well here based on my other testing. Sonic Superstars is set to 0.75x resolution in handheld mode, and the frame rate is definitely holding up. Unfortunately, the game did exhibit some choppy audio despite the gameplay itself being fine. I have a good feeling this one will be fully playable at some point in the near future. And let's talk about a fairly new release that I've personally been very excited about. The Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is set here to 0.75x in handheld mode, and the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro is set to high performance. This is one that is doing pretty well and for me is really awesome to see on such a compact device. I was definitely pleasantly surprised to see Prince of Persia working with Yuzu, and it's definitely perfect timing since I've been working my way through this one being a big fan of the series in general. Finally, I showcased Super Mario Wonder in my early look, but this time around I wanted to show off a bit of Super Mario 3D World and Bowser's Fury, which surprised me with its performance using Yuzu. I do have this game set to use 0.5x native resolution, which gave me the smoothest performance, but given the smaller screen here with the 4 Pro, I don't feel like image quality has suffered at all here. The game still looks very good and vibrant and quite enjoyable to play on the 4 Pro. Again, for me, there's a sense of joy just seeing these games working on the Pocket 4 Pro. Let's now cover a bit of Android gaming, which has always been something that I like to cover on this channel. I'm going to start off with a viewer request with Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, and this is the Netflix edition, also known as the definitive edition of the game, which is available to purchase on the Play Store. The game seems to be locked at 30 frames per second, and it does hold it quite well based on the built-in frame counter with the 4 Pro. The visuals are great here, and the built-in controls from the Pocket 4 Pro work without any issue. It's definitely great to see a game like San Andreas working this well. Now, another viewer request was the mobile version of Fortnite, and it's definitely one worth checking out given how popular the game is, and with the built-in controls makes the 4 Pro an awesome way to play Fortnite. For this one, I let Fortnite auto set the options, which default to the high settings at 30 frames per second, and the 4 Pro has done pretty well here maintaining its target FPS. Finally, I'll use Genshin Impact as our last Android game, and just to quickly show off the built-in gamepad mapping tool of the 4 Pro. If you're familiar with Retroid devices, this is nothing new and works essentially the same way. You simply drag in from the right side and then select key mapping and the menu will appear on screen. 
there are options to drag the left and right analog stick on screen, as well as set individual buttons. You simply drag the analog sticks where you want them to go, and when placed down, you can then set additional settings of how the analog sticks react to the action on screen. With the button mapping, you simply drag the button icon over the location you want it to go, and then press the corresponding physical button to map. It's a very simple thing to set up, and great for games that don't have built-in controller support. Once you're all done, just hit save and you should be good to go. By the way, Genshin here is running quite well in medium settings locked to 30 frames per second, and this can definitely go a bit higher if you'd like. Okay, after all this gaming, let's talk about battery life, and I spent a good amount of time here trying to get a feel for what to expect, and just in general things that I discovered during this process. Let's start out with the worst case scenario, and for that I used my usual test with God of War 2 running at 2 times native resolution with the high performance mode and the smart fan setting. I have the device itself set to 50% brightness and volume with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on. God of War 2 came in at under 2 hours of battery life, which really surprised me. But battery results definitely improve from here on out. So let's take it down one level and test out performance mode with the smart fan setting and at 50% brightness and volume with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth still turned on, we came in with a little improvement with two and a half hours of gameplay. God of War for this was set to native resolution and is definitely a demanding game even at native resolution. So let's now try out God of War 2 with just the standard performance mode with the fan turned off at native resolution to scale down some of the requirements needed for the game. This is where things got interesting. I noticed not too long in that the device started to thermal throttle, so I decided to stop this test since really if we're not able to run God of War 2 at native resolution with standard performance and the fan turned off, then there isn't much to test here. Naturally, I decided to do the test again with standard performance, but this time with the quiet fan setting turned on to help with thermals. The Pocket 4 Pro at 50% brightness and volume with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, and God of War at native resolution, the 4 Pro hit a little more than 3 hours and 45 minutes. So I wanted to do a test without the fan on, and because we know that my usual God of War 2 was a bit too much for the 4 Pro on the thermal side, I went with God of War Chains of Olympus on the PlayStation Portable using PPSSPP, and here I have the Pocket 4 Pro set again to 50% brightness and volume with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, using the standard performance mode with the no fan option. I actually went with 4 times native resolution here, which makes the game look great, and the 4 Pro did really well with this test, hitting over 5 hours of gameplay and no throttling observed during this test. Now for my lightest test, as usual, I use Yoshi's Island for Super Nintendo, and I have set the 4 Pro to use the standard performance mode with the fan off, as well as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi turned off at 50% brightness and volume. The 4 Pro managed a little over 12 and a half hours with Yoshi's Island for this lighter test, which isn't the best I've seen on the channel, but in reality is a very solid amount of playtime and more than anyone will need in one sitting. Let's talk about the surface temperatures now. We know that the device can definitely reach a point where it throttles performance, at least as we saw in God of War 2. So let's go ahead and use that as our first test. The 4 Pro is set to standard performance with the fan turned off. Surface temperatures at the front hovered in the 30s range with the highest numbers at the center where the display is maxing out at around 38 degrees Celsius. On the left side where the D-pad and analog stick are, temperatures were a little warmer than I'd like to see staying at around that mid 30s range. On the right side where the face buttons are, it was much cooler at around 28 degrees Celsius. On the back side of the face buttons, temperatures were around that same mark staying pretty cool. Likewise, the backside where the D-pad stayed around that mid-30s range, and again, the middle was the hottest that I recorded at about 41 to 42 degrees, which is understandable given this is where the intake vent is. Now let's turn this fan back on, and I set it to sport mode to see how well this fan moves hot air away from the 4 Pro. I left this alone for a few minutes and then recorded new numbers. The fan definitely has improved surface temperatures here. On the right side, temperatures remain the same but improvements start to be seen towards the middle and then especially on the left. It does look like we dropped a few degrees here. And on the back, it's the same story with numbers lower overall, but most impressive is the drop in the center around the vent, dropping almost as much as 10 degrees Celsius. Definitely an improvement, and it does show the effectiveness of the active cooling. Now in my early look, I did mention the fan is pretty audible on that smart mode setting, and it can be as well when using the smart option. I talked about how I hope that Retroid would either adjust the fan curves or just give us the option to do it ourselves. The recent update that corrected the screen issue included some adjustments to the fan curve, but honestly I haven't really noticed a difference and the fan is still audible especially on that sport mode setting and worth mentioning again here. I do hope that Retroid will continue to roll out updates and eventually give us the option to set our own curves. So is the 4 Pro a worthy upgrade from the 3 Plus? Yes, I think that the 4 Pro brings a lot to the table and improves on the 3 Plus in almost every way. 
the jump in performance from the 3 Plus with the T618 to the Dimensity 1100 in the 4 Pro is fairly substantial, not only on paper, but also in terms of real-world performance. We are seeing better performance across the board for all the games that would run on the 3 Plus. For example, Untitled Goose Game was a Switch game that I remember working with the 3 Plus, but just didn't quite have the grunt to run it at full speed. But now with the 4 Pro, it's running closer to that 60 frames per second target and at a higher resolution setting. This is true for many other games that I've tested across various emulators and even for native Android gaming. But there are games that simply wouldn't run or work on the 3 Plus that are now playable on the 4 Pro. And so the playable library of games expands with the arrival of the 4 Pro. The arrival of the 4 Pro also means that we now have a new standard at that $199 price point. The 4 Pro brings more performance than other competitors at or near this price point, such as the Odin Lite and Pro. It's exciting to see this level of performance in a device with this form factor, and while devices like the Odin Pro and Lite certainly have a place in the market, I do think that the Pocket 4 Pro at $199 is a big deal. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Odin 2, which at its starting price of $299 is an absolute game changer. However, for some, the amount of performance that the 4 Pro brings at $199 will be more than enough, and some might find that the extra $100 isn't warranted. But the reality is that we can keep going up in price, and then with another $100, you're at the Steam Deck's territory. The beautiful thing today is that we do have so many options for various use cases at various price points, and at the end of the day, the 4 Pro serves a specific audience that I think will greatly enjoy the device, and so I do think that the 4 Pro has now set a new standard at this price point, and I'm excited to see how others respond to this. This has been an absolute doozy of a video, and I sincerely thank you for sticking around to the end. Let me know down in the comments what you think about the 4 Pro, and has yours arrived already, or are you planning on getting one? As always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.